Well, thank you very much. I feel very honored to be able to present my point of view here to such a distinguished audience. It's certainly the case that artificial intelligence has advanced tremendously in the last years. And a question has been raised very often, quite since the beginning of the subject, which is whether and when, if whether, uh, the subject of artificial intelligence will reach the level of human intelligence. Now, I think it's very likely that the, it, the, it will reach the level of one particular part of the brain, namely the cerebellum. Now, I want to make a distinction between, well, there are many parts of the brain, but two parts in particular. One of them is the cerebrum, which is the part people usually refer to up here, and the cerebellum at the back, a little bit underneath. The two have a comparable number of neurons each. And the cerebellum has far more connections between neurons than the cerebrum does. So you might think that the cerebellum would have much more computational power than the cerebrum. And I think that's probably true. And it's quite possible with the advance of artificial intelligence that one may, might reach the level of cerebellar activity. I like to think of the relationship between the two, that is to say the cerebrum and the cerebellum, is a bit like the programmer and the pro action of the program. Because it's the, say you're learning to drive a car and you're learning how to reverse or something like that, well then, initially, you have to work out, you know, if I move my arm in this particular way, and so on, then the car will do such and such, um, and you think through in a conscious way. But after a while, you don't have to think about it consciously, and the cerebellum takes over. And we know that when people play the piano, and they can play extraordinarily fast and accurately, they're not thinking about how they move each finger, that's all done unconsciously by the cerebellum. And likewise, if somebody, a tennis player or something like that, uh, the skills, they, the tennis player would not um, you know, work, work out which muscle should move at each stage. All those things are controlled unconsciously. And these unconscious actions are the kind of thing that one can well believe might well be something that you could, you could imitate um, by some artificial intelligence system. And when I say artificial intelligence, I mean computer controlled in the sense that we now understand that term. Now, why do I say there might be something different about the cerebrum? Well, this really dated back to the early 1950s when I started doing research at Cambridge on a completely different subject. This was a mathematical subject, algebraic geometry, uh, which didn't seem to have anything to do with AI and such. But I was very intrigued by, I'd heard about Gödel's theorem, and it said, apparently, so I thought, that there are things in mathematics that you just can't prove. Uh, and I didn't like that idea. So I went to this course on mathematical logic given by a man called Steen, very good course, and I learned about Turing machines, and I learned about Gödel's theorem. And he taught me about Gödel's, and other people in the class, about Gödel's theorem, and it didn't say, quite what I was afraid it might say, that there are things you couldn't prove. What it said is that if you have a system of proof procedures, and these proof procedures are such that you could put them on a computer to check whether they have been accurately carried through, then these proof procedures end up by saying, you, you feed in your theorem, and at the end it says yes, means proved, no, no it's wrong, or don't know. Don't know, it doesn't say don't know, it just goes on forever. Now the thing is that um, what the Gödel theorem is, has a following character. That is, if you believe that this system never gives you the wrong answer, if you trust it, if you have reason to believe that it's right, and that using it gives the right answers to mathematical problems, then you must also believe a particular statement constructed from the rules must be true, yet unobtainable by means of those rules. Now, I found this absolutely stunning when I heard that. It's not that you can't prove this thing, it's just that you have to use procedures which transcend the ones you're using. And the key thing is, it's your belief that these procedures actually work. So if you're prepared to trust the procedures when it says, yes, it's true, that it really is true, 
if you have enough belief in that, then you also believe the statement which goes beyond them. You somehow can transcend those rules. And I thought that was amazing. And it sort of tells you that your understanding of why the rules work is more than using the rules. And that's really what it does say. And what does that mean? Understanding, well, you see, you look at the rules and you say, yeah, I think that one's okay. That one, I'm, oh, ah, yeah, that's okay too. And you go through that kind of reasoning. And if you're convinced it's okay, then not only do you trust using those rules, but you can trust the girl procedure for jumping beyond the rules. And this struck me as amazing. It's understanding transcends those rules. Now, this made me think, well, our whatever it is that makes us understand things, and that seems to require a conscious perception of things, that is something which is not governed by rules. It's not quite so clear as that, because it's rules that you know and can appreciate. Maybe there are some rules in our head that are so complicated that we don't know what they are and we can't know what they are, something like that. But I don't think that can be the case. It, that troubled me and it troubles other logicians who complain about what I write about and so on. But the thing is, you have to ask the question, how did we come about with our understanding of mathematics? And well, I have a cartoon, which I can't really show you here, but which shows the ancient, our ancient ancestors doing all sorts of wonderful things, uh, building, building mammoth traps, um, uh, uh, making crops and building houses and domesticating animals and things like that. And then in the foreground is this poor old mathematician who's trying to prove some theorem and there's a saber-toothed tiger just about to pounce on him. The demonstration is really to show that there is no particular ad advant selective advantage in being a mathematician. In fact, I think it's rather a disadvantage, actually. Um, but the thing is that, okay, general understanding, yes, that's something could easily have been selected and was by natural selection. I'm quite happy with that. And this general understanding can be applied in different areas. There's also a nice example, which I could show you, of a Gödel's theorem, but it's, I won't show you here. You'd be grateful for that. It's a thing called Goodstein's theorem. It's a very nice one to give when you've got the time, because it's something that can be appreciated by people who don't know much mathematics. But the thing about this theorem is, you start with any number, and when I say a number, I mean a natural number, which means zero, one, two, three, four, whole numbers which are not negative. And if you take, we know about the procedure to prove a thing for all, you see, one of the amazing things about understanding is that you can understand an infinite number of things. People often say, well, you can't understand infinity, can you really? Well, yes, you can. That's the thing what you can do, a human being can do, but a computer really can't, and that's really the point. But let me give you an example of how a human being might do it, and we learn this at school. Suppose you have a proposition, P of N, which depends on the number N. And all you have to prove is two things. First of all, it's true for zero, and secondly, if it's true for n, then it's true for n plus 1. And that's standard mathematical induction. That shows it's true for all n. Now, the thing about this Goodstein theorem is it can't prove it using that thing. It's a girdle theorem. It's a thing like that. But yet you can understand it. I'm not going to describe it, but let me give a rough idea. You're given a number, any, any natural number, and you apply to this two procedures. Procedure A, and that, me, that me is a way of getting this number and makes it bigger. Procedure B, which is subtract one. A makes it bigger, B subtract one. And by making it bigger, it makes it hugely bigger, absolutely hugely bigger. And what's so un not obvious is that it's a real tortoise and the hare. B always wins, and it comes right down to zero. But it does it in so horrendously many steps that you'd never go through it. In fact, if you start with a number four, it goes through so many steps that no computer that's ever been conceived of could ever go through all those steps. Yet with a pencil and paper, you could see by following the steps, oh yeah, yeah, that's going to come, aha, I see it's going to come down. What kind of reasoning tells you that? Well, it's our understanding. So I think that this shows that whatever understanding is, it's not something that you can encap encapsulate computationally. Anyway, I came to that view after hearing Steen's talk, but it was a bit worrying. Because what do we do? What is consciousness? What is understanding? Is it some magical thing which sort of swishes into our heads at some point and, and something like that? Well, I don't like that idea at all. It seems to me that it must be something in the laws of physics because our brains are governed by the same physical laws as everything else. I don't think there is something else going on there. But what are the laws of physics? And this, I took advantage of going to other courses, one by Bondi on general relativity, one by Dirac 
on quantum mechanics. And I thought, well, you could put a thing about general relativity on a computer. In fact, now we have good examples of this because people probably here have heard of the LIGO detection of black holes spiraling into each other, some galaxy millions and millions of light years away, and uh, waves come along, and then the specific signal that you see from those waves can be seen in the, de the gravitation wave detector. And you have to pick this out from a whole lot of noise and stuff. And how do we know that particular signal indicates two black holes spiraling into each other and producing gravitation waves? Well, from an extraordinary amount of computation. So this is really high-powered, I don't know if you call it AI, but certainly direct computation of this particular problem. Really powerful stuff. And it shows the accuracy of this kind of com computation. So general relativity is something which you can really put on a computer and do it very, very precisely. Now, how about quantum mechanics? That's the other big revolution of 20th century physics. General relativity, I learned, I learned from Bondi. Quantum mechanics from Dirac. And quantum mechanics, yes, you can put the Schrodinger equation. There are some problems with it. But you can put the Schrodinger equation on the computer, and you could imagine what, how to simulate a brain or something and put this on the computer, and it chugs away, and it solves Schrodinger's equation. But then there's a catch. Because Schrodinger's equation, as Schrodinger himself was clear to point out, does not tell you what happens in the world. You've probably heard about Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger introduced this idea really to show the absurdity of his own equation as applied to rather extreme situations. The cat is something which you put into a state which, according to the Schrodinger equation, is dead and alive at the same time. Now, Schrodinger was saying, look, this is ridiculous. He didn't quite say it like that, but he was saying, this is ridiculous. There must be something wrong with my equation. That's Schrodinger's equation. And he really did think there was something missing. And Einstein did, and de Broglie did, and even Dirac, although he wasn't quite so keen on making his views clear, thought the same sort of thing. And in fact, the first lecture I went to by Dirac, he illustrated this thing called the superposition principle, which is used in the Schrodinger's cat, dead and alive at the same time. You see, what you have in quantum mechanics, a particle can be here and here at the same time. And that's a great thing to get your mind around. But the theory works. Now, the thing is that um, that's not the whole story because Schrodinger's equation tells you dead and alive at the same time. And that's not what you see. You see either dead or alive. So something happens. <laughs> You've changed something down there. <laughs> Excuse me. Something happens that uh, is not part of the Schrodinger equation. And that's what you call making a measurement. Then making a measurement involves a device, which probably is surely is a quantum device too, like everything else. So what's the difference? But anyway, there is something happens which doesn't follow the Schrodinger equation. It makes a choice. The universe makes a choice between that and that. And you can make a criterion, so combining the theories that I was talking about, to say if you move so much mass into a superposition of two locations, how long does that live? And you can work out a lifetime if you believe something to do with quantum mechanics and general relativity together, which is not part of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics does not say that the thing becomes one or the other. You have to wheel in another procedure, and it's sort of inconsistent. So you have to get used to that idea when you use quantum mechanics. Now, what is that other procedure? Nobody knows. It's what's called the collapse of the wave function or the reduction of the state. But the thing is, for me, that was the gap. That's the one thing that you could not put on a computer. In fact, I like to call it this. I, I collaborated later with Stuart Hameroff. You see, I couldn't see how neurons could ever make use of this thing. But uh, Stuart Hameroff told me about these things called microtubules, which seem to inhabit all cells, in the, almost all cells in the body, and particular neurons, and these things which should seal information away from the outside world and use quantum mechanics in an essential way. I should make the point, people often say, well, quantum mechanics is irrelevant to the brain action or something. Of course, it can't be true because chemistry uses crucially quantum mechanics. So you don't mean chem chemistry, you mean something else. Some kind of quantum mechanics beyond chemistry. OK, well, there's lots of that. Well, we see that in photosynthesis. You see, in photosynthesis, there are very subtle quantum effects which take place and which go beyond the ordinary procedures of chemistry. 
So in the brain, there could easily be something like that, particularly in the microtubules, and I think that's very likely correct. The microtubules are little tiny tubes of sort of nanoscale, and they, according to Stuart Hameroff, my colleague who, his day job is to put people to sleep reversibly. He's an anesthesiologist, and he's really interested in what he's actually doing when he does that. And his view is that general anesthetics affect microtubules. There's not quite a bit of evidence for that. And this sends you to sleep in a reversible way. And so the thing is that the microtubules would be making this choice. And what's the choice? Well, the choice is what we don't know about in nature. Nature just says it's random. And I don't think it is probably just random. It's something extremely subtle. It's something beyond computation. That's my view. And the view would be that you could associate with every action of this state reduction process or collapse the wave junction process with an element of what we call proto-consciousness. And proto-consciousness would be the building block out of which genuine consciousness is built. So we have to understand that part. Nature somehow makes these little choices, but they don't mean anything. In the brain, these choices do mean something. And that is when we maybe make a conscious choice. It's a very interesting idea. A lot of people, of course, are skeptical of this kind of idea. But it seems to me you do need somewhere where you take advantage of this part of the physical world as we understand physics, which goes beyond com computational simulation. And this is the place I think it has to lie in. And uh, that's the point of view that we take. And it, we, there are experiments which maybe can shed some good light on that. Thank you very much.